Thought Leadership from PwC. Welcome to PwC's Accounting Podcast. I'm Heather Horn, and I'm here today with some exciting news about our plan for 2023. We're kicking off a new Tuesday series designed to bring you the most timely and relevant reporting content each week, content you won't find anywhere else. In planning the runway, though, we decided to shake things up a bit. So what are we doing differently? We're actually allowing the podcast to be taken over. Sort of. I'll still be the host. But instead of just me and the producers deciding on the topics, we're bringing in our all-star guests to help. Who are these, quote, all-stars? Since we launched four years ago, we have a few guests who have gone above and beyond to bring something special to the podcast, whether they were part of one of the most downloaded episodes or they have a particularly engaging or interesting presence. Each month, we'll be asking one of these all-stars to pick the topics for the month and to join me on the episodes. So the most immediate question is, where do we start? For the month of February, our takeover guest is Andrea Soul. Given Andreas' passion for intangibles, which would be well known to regular listeners on the podcast, he is the perfect person to walk us through one of a company's most valuable intangible assets, human capital. This month's series addresses what human capital is and why it matters, to how it's treated in financial and ESG reporting, to how its value is reflected in deals. Human capital or people are our most important asset. You really need to bake that concept into how you, uh, how you run your business. Automation is something which is which should complement your existing labor pool. In many cases, it shouldn't entirely substitute labor. That's Andreas and Zain Siddiqui, a senior economist with PwC Intelligence. Together, they'll break down the macroeconomic and demographic trends leading to the scarcity of human capital today and how companies should think about human capital potentially differently than they have before. They have great perspectives to share, so let's get started. Andrea Sane, welcome to the podcast, and thanks for kicking off our year of monthly deep dives into special topics, starting with human capital. And Andreas, one of the sort of special features of the series we're doing this year is each month asking one of our regular guests to kind of own the series and be the one to uh, decide what we're going to talk about. So I know this was your brainchild. So what was your idea and what are we going to be covering this month? Sure. So maybe just a quick overview of what the episodes are going to cover. You know, you'll often hear members of management say people are our most important asset. And I don't want to say that, the, that they don't mean that when they when they say it. But I think it's fair to say that the way companies have sort of managed human capital historically has been different than how they look at other types of assets. And the link to between human capital and how the company creates value has been less clear than maybe it is for things like brands or other intellectual property. Um, there hasn't been a lot of reporting in financial statements and otherwise around human capital. I think we're seeing some changes as we have the rise of ESG reporting that will uh, highlight some more data and information around human capital. And we will also um, explore the fact that in the M&A world, we're seeing a really fundamental shift in how companies that are serial acquirers, such as private equity funds, think about human capital in a transaction and how it can often be a key driver of why the transaction is happening or a key driver of the, uh, of the pricing. So that's an overview of some of the topics we'll cover um, throughout the series. All right. Well, and Andreas, I love this topic for February because as you well know, most of our listeners are in the finance function and February, I feel like it's a time when there is the most stress on resources and, and the time people are looking ahead to how they can change things in the future. So a lot of good information for people as they're thinking about their own sort of business and situation. And I think just to dive in and start things off, one of the key questions here is just the broader macroeconomic trends and what that means from a demographic and talent perspective and really honing in on this talent shortage we've seen, it feels like since the beginning of the pandemic. And, you know, that's almost three years at this point. But in contrast, prior to that, it seemed like we had an abundant labor supply. So, so what's the cause? What are we seeing um, as the factors that are impacting that? So I think 
we have to realize that most business leaders have come up in the time when labor was plentiful. If you go back to the last three decades, really since the 1980s, uh, globalization led to the largest ever labor supply, supply shock that we saw globally. Uh, we saw the integration of the two of the uh, biggest population centers, China and India. In the global economy, companies had access to productive pools of labor, not just at home, but abroad. And then when it comes to the U.S., uh, we had two other developments which happened in the 1950s. The first was the baby boom generation, but the second, which I think was uh, a lot more profound was the woman's entry into the workforce, which gave us the fastest growth in the labor force in our country's recorded history. The issue now, uh, Heather, as you noted, is that these trends are reversing. Companies have been used to operating in this demographic sweet spot, which is now turning sour. Uh, and we are moving towards a postmodern economy where real wages are increasing in both India and China. As demographic trends reverse, geopolitical tensions are also causing accessibility issues for companies who may want to access newer, lower cost labor markets abroad. But the biggest difference, I think, was COVID, uh, which compressed about 10 years of demographic change, at least when it comes to the U.S., into roughly 20 weeks. Wow. So what are some of those factors then that impacted us from COVID? I know we've talked about it a bit before on the podcast, but let's kind of re you know level set for this um, episode today. So when we talk about COVID, and I think this has increasingly been the trend, we talk about the surge in COVID demand, the consumer demand that we saw coming out of the pandemic, the ex explosive job growth that we saw, and we still are seeing very strong job growth in the labor market. But I think what we don't really talk about enough is the impact on labor supply, right? So COVID is something which has led to permanent scarring on the labor force. If you look at the women's participation rate, it took us at least three decades to get to a point where we were before COVID. Then COVID happened, Women felt the disproportionate burden of childcare and schooling, and the rate fell sharply. And it hasn't really recovered too much since. And in fact, it has fallen in recent months. We also had more than 2 million people who retired early. This is on top of the usual retirements we get in a given year. When you look at foreign talent, we are missing some 1.4 million immigrants, which we won't be able to make up through higher future immigration because we have numerical limits on our visas that we let in every year. Uh, and then there are other more slightly troubling trends. I think we have been focusing too much on the older workers and rightfully so. But what we are also finding is that people uh, in their early 20s are now about 3% less likely to be in the workforce than prior to the pandemic. And, the, and for people between the ages of 25 and 54, this is your prime working age population. The rate is roughly uh, a percent uh, lower. So there is something profound, I think, going on in terms of worker preferences. Now, it could be due to burnout could be due to underemployment or lack of good jobs, but it's a crisis in the making. And then um, overlaid, obviously, on top of these issues are that we are going through a peak demographic drag. The U.S. working age population um, is expected to grow at its lowest rate over the next decade uh, since post-World War, mainly due to falling birth rates and lower immigration volumes. Uh, but we are also very quickly moving past uh, the baby boom dividend. The peak year of the baby boom generation was 1957. This cohort is going to be turning 65 sometime this or next year. This is when they become eligible for retirement benefits. And by 2030, uh, all baby boomers will be at least 65. So this, I think, means that labor supply uh, will be lower for longer. It's not just a pandemic phenomenon. The pandemic was an accelerant. We are already seeing a fundamental shift towards higher labor bargaining power. We are seeing more unionization activity. And the positive sentiment towards unionization is at a historic high. And when we look at these trends, it becomes very clear that higher wage growth is probably going to be the biggest source of margin pressure for many companies in the coming years. Yeah. And I saying there's so many things that you said there to really stand out to me, though, and, and not to be glib about this, but you were talking about sort of the the younger generation and that they're 3% less likely to be in the workforce. And I mean, I don't know, when I was 22, I didn't really feel like I had an option not to be in the workforce. So is there some factors there that are, are leading to these, you know, to them feeling like they, they can 
not join the workforce the way maybe we felt like we needed to? I think fundamentally the value sets are very different, right? I think generally the labor, younger workers know that they have a lot more bargaining power. They are demanding much higher uh, uh, benefits. They are making sure that the firm is uh, investing in them. It's raising their acumen. They are being uh, they are drawn to corporate cultures which are attractive, which are with the time. Uh, so we see a lot of that. At the same time, you have seen uh, robust growth in, in gig economy. So we are finding that self-employment rates have really shot up. And obviously, that's a labor pool which is not being accessed by corporates the way it was before. You have people who value their independence a lot more. They value work-life flexibility. Uh, it's a lot of different trends which are coalescing and which is which is leading to different worker preferences moving forward. Well, and saying you touched on my other point, which is the bargaining power of this generation. And you, you know, had previously mentioned unions, and we did see in November and December. I'm in LA. You're in LA. You know, we saw the impact of the um, UC system strike by the, you know, research assistants and all of the non professors, and just the impact that it that it, that had, and that ultimately was settled because they, you know, the university operations basically ground to halt when it came to time for finals and final grades. So you really did see the impact of that and the fact that they kind of stood up and said, hey, you know, we need better pay, better benefits and all those types of things. So it is some sort of interesting trends there that you could see really play out on a large scale. But Zane, with all of that said, then, what does this mean from an economic perspective? So that's a great question. I think uh, aging workforce uh, a shrinking working age population is a growth negative, right? This is something which can manifest in so many different ways. Uh, labor shortages can prevent companies from operating at capacity. We actually saw this during the pandemic, which meant that companies had to forego millions in sales and profits because they couldn't get their headcount up. Uh, rising labor costs, uh, is something which is going to contribute to inflationary pressures down the road as well, especially for businesses who still have a very labor intensive business model. Uh, but it also goes back to this abstract concept in economics. Uh, it's called Cobb Douglas production function. I just may have given your listeners nightmares about their <laughs> Econ 101 courses back in college, but Cobb Douglas production function is uh, fundamentally an accounting identity. And what it says is if you want to keep growing and producing at the same rate, you need two things, a labor force and physical capital. But it also matters how productive each of those two inputs are. So if the size of the labor force is growing slowly, but you still wish to maintain the same level of output and growth, then it's basic arithmetic. You either need to deploy more capital, which includes technology, or you increase the productivity of your existing labor through investments in human capital, building trust, having an attractive corporate culture, or a combination of both capital and human capital investments. But I think these are some of the trade-offs we are going to be facing as an economy and as businesses moving forward. So... Zane, I want to pull Andreas into this, but one more question for you, because it feels like we've perpetually had growth in the gross domestic product that just seems like it's always in the news that grew, it grew, it grew. And I know that's not entirely true, but are we now expecting to see it shrinking or it's hard to predict what's going to happen? We will see it slow down quite a bit, and that's mainly driven by a shrinking working age population. So when we measure long-term growth, we also look at working age population. And if the working age population is growing slowly, then the long-term economic growth is going to uh, grow slowly as well. I think one other way to put this or to think about this is that the, the, eco the size of the economic pie will continue to grow, but at a somewhat slower rate. But that also means that for cor many corporations, they would look at compressed revenues. Margin pre preservation is going to become difficult. They would either need to engage in M&A uh, and other acquisition activity to gain a much larger market share, or they would have to look at new sources of growth abroad outside of the U.S. So then, Andreas, that's actually a perfect point to bring you back into the conversation, because I know you look at 
all of this through evaluation lens and a, a, a lens in terms of how companies are thinking about their own value. So as you think about human capital sort of in 2023 and forward, what are some of the things that companies should or are thinking about? Well, so when I when I listen to Zane, what I think is that uh, if if human capital becomes more scarce, and this is not just a U.S. phenomenon, this is happening kind of in all developed countries around the world to a greater or lesser extent, um, it means that the price of human capital is going to go up because we have all sorts of indications that demand is not going down. So if you reduce supply, that drives up the price, and so what does that translate into for companies? Well, it means that you have to figure out how you create more value from your workforce. Otherwise, you will get the margin compression that that Zane mentioned, right? Because if you have to pay more to buy a or to get access to an asset that you need for your business, but you're not able to create additional value through deploying that asset, that effectively translates into uh, margin compression, which then translates into lower value of your uh, of your of your business or your or your enterprise, and so I I think what that means is that companies really need to focus on what types of investments they're making in human capital, um, measuring those returns in ways that they they haven't really focused on historically. So you know viewing it as at least in part an investment and not just a you know an expense, which is I think the way a lot of reporting and uh, not just in financial statements, but in, you know, broader reporting to uh, investors and other stakeholders kind of views a lot of uh, money that goes out the door related to human capital as, a, as an expenditure rather than investment. That mindset probably needs to change, but you really need to think about are those investments going to drive increases in the value of your human capital so that the value and the price stay aligned, which then uh, allows you to you know, maintain your or, or expand your, uh, your your margins. So this idea went back to the first statement I made in the podcast that, you know, human capital or people are our most important asset. You really need to bake that concept into how you, uh, how you run your business because you need to view human capital as an asset. And so you need to think about investments that enhance the value of an asset just the same way you would about making investments to enhance the value of your brand or making investments to fund R&D projects that are going to create, uh, you know, intellectual property that will allow you to uh, that you can monetize in the uh, in the future. So, Andreas, I love this idea of thinking of it as an investment, not an expense. However, this then collides with an issue I know you have with financial reporting, which is the fact that your workforce is an asset that is not on your books. And so you talk about making an investment in your workforce, and this is just creating expense for the company. So if I'm the CFO and I'm thinking, great, I want to invest in my workforce, I want productivity, I want these demand cur- or supply curves to, to move in the right direction and everything else you guys have been talking about but it's not helping my bottom line. So how, I guess, how do you think about financial reporting and what it potentially could do, but also then just from a practical CFO perspective, how would you think about this? Yeah, so we're going to have a whole podcast on on the financial reporting uh, elements of this, but I guess maybe what I would say at this juncture is, you know, external reporting is one thing, you know, for internal purposes and often people try to get the internal reporting sorted before you start worrying about external reporting. Uh, This idea that you probably need data that you haven't had in the past in order to make this distinction between what's an investment and what is, uh, what is truly a, an expenditure or, you know, just money that goes out the door in order to keep the lights on as, as it, as it were Um, that, Companies need to start focusing on, can I get the data to actually break those two things out and then start looking at, can I also capture data to demonstrate that the investments I am making are creating value um, and that they're creating value at a, at a rate that makes sense given you know the cost of capital of the enterprise. Sort of a similar type thought process that you would apply to R&D expenditures where you know, you have to do some sort of a 
present value calculation to make sure the money you're spending on R&D is going to generate enough economic benefit to warrant the investment. To the extent you're making investments in human capital, you should at least have a similar type of thought process. But starting to develop the systems and processes that you actually have that data so you can make better decisions is probably the first step. And then external reporting, whether that's through financial reporting or perhaps through some of this sustainability reporting where you know human capital is very a very important part of the the S of ESG you know that'll that'll get sorted out over the next couple of uh, years as as standards evolve both on the the accounting and the ESG side yes and actually I was going to bring in ESG although I know I don't want to dig too deep into some of this that we're going to talk about later but Andreas I think if we're thinking again valuation and I'm just thinking I'm the CFO a lot of this investment is intangible in the generic sense of the word. So I give my, and one, actually one of the ones Hillary Eastman and I spoke about on our investor survey podcast back in December was uh, allowing your employees to spend time on, you know, charitable endeavors that are important to them. And she was talking about it from an ESG lens, like how does that really align with the company's uh you know, vision and otherwise, like, is, the, is that really something that you're doing that is benefiting the company's values, et cetera? But let's just take that one as an example, because there isn't like a dollar payoff there, right? And so how does someone quant- start to quantify that type of an investment? And if we're getting too deep into future episodes, you can just we can just give this as like a teaser for the audience. Yeah, well, I think we're, we will touch on this in the the M and A episode where we'll talk a little bit about how certain sophisticated acquirers are doing exactly this to put to put real dollars around um, different types of investments you can make in human capital, um, which would include things like giving people the flexibility to to uh, engage in some activities on company time that maybe don't have that same traditional direct link to I'm um, making a product or I'm engaging with a customer or, or, or things of that nature, but might be something like um, charitable work. And this idea that uh, you, you, you can quantify some of these things and that some employees may come to you and say, Hey, I'm much more interested in having this flexibility than I am in whether my 401k match is X percent or Y percent. And so that uh, you, you actually have as a, uh, you know, as a, as a business owner or prospective acquirer, you have different options in terms of what types of compensation packages, but also broader packages of of benefits and opportunities that you can present to people and those have different costs and some employees will value different pieces of that differently but the different pieces will have different costs and so you have to do the analysis and you may find out that some of the things that cost you less are things that employees or certain segments of your employee base value more and then you hit that sweet spot where you can uh, you know potentially lower your costs and have a higher level of employee engagement, satisfaction, whatever your your measure of of value is for those uh, for those programs, lower turnover. I mean, there's many metrics that you can that you can monitor that are closely tied to uh, to value. So, Zane, bringing you back into it from a broader macroeconomic perspective, then. So, I'm. I asked the question about all these individual CFOs making their own decisions, right? But then you are, you know, you and other economists are taking stuff a step back to say, okay, what does this really mean for an economy as a whole? And what what does this mean when you look at all these trends that we've had in the past and then maybe some of these changing trends, what do we expect to see? And what is that going to mean from a workforce perspective? I think a couple things. Probably the most immediate challenge for businesses over the next few years will still be attracting and retaining talent, um, given the shortages that we're probably going to go through. I think employers will need to think about flexible work arrangements. uh, And as I mentioned, creating a corporate culture uh, that's with the times. 
as well as what Andrea said, they need to continue to invest in human capital. I think that's critical. They need to be investing in building trust with their employees. Uh, and one way of doing that is by making sure that their employees are uh, scaling up. Um, so uh, I think one thing which concerns me, though, is that when you look at most of these investments, whether they're in human capital or technology, they're concentrated only among a relatively small subset of companies. Uh, if you look at the data, um, I think it's about 10% of firms by market value that account for over 60% of these types of investments. And what's happening is that these companies who have invested, who have moved early on, they're pulling away from the rest of the companies in terms of performance. And you see that in the investor data. I think investors are worried about labor costs generally, as well as labor supply uh, shortages. Um, wages will remain a key issue focus for many of these investors, as well as do you have an adequate labor supply, uh, which could meet the demand. Uh, and we looked at companies um, a few months ago. Uh, these companies had high labor cost as a share of operating profits. And what we found was really interesting. Uh, you had these companies who had been underperforming the market really since the pandemic. Uh, they have been trading at a discount of about 10% to the market when you look at the forward P.E. ratio. So I think this is an area which will continue to be a focus for most capital providers. And on the flip side, you see market rewarding companies who have invested in digital infrastructure, automation, investments in human capital. Let me ask another question, and you're both welcome to weigh in here, because as I listen, if part of the fundamental issue here is the labor supply, and then you have another issue, which is I'll call it the skill of the labor. So, you know, do they have the right skill set and talents that are going to build uh, profit for their organizations? Part of the fundamental issue then seems like it comes back to education before the people are even entering the workforce. And that's not something individual corporations are going to solve and also seems like something difficult to solve from a, a government perspective. So is that something that companies we think should be focused on in some way? I know I'm from power and utilities industry, which frequent listeners know, and they, they have a lot of apprenticeship programs because they ran into this issue with their linemen and otherwise. And, and so they kind of address the issue that way. But is that something we expect to see more broadly, Zane? Or is that really something we need to wait and see what the government does? And it's just a broader structural issue with here in the US? I think the biggest lever that the government has is immigration. Um, but it's not a low hanging fruit, unfortunately, right? It's a highly political issue. And when you talk with uh, folks in Washington, D.C., you find out very quickly that uh, there is very little chance, at least in the near term, for a bipartisan uh, support for immigration reform. There are obviously other investments that, they, that we could make from a public policy perspective. That means investment in education, making sure that we have the STEM talent, which is in short supply, for example, that we have availability of technical talent down the road. Uh, but there's only so much we can do when the working age population is supposed to grow at the slowest rate um, in our at least during the post-World War period. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right, Heather. I mean, there's clearly a, you know, skills quality or mismatch issue, but the demographic trends are very clear that there's a quantity issue here as well. It's not just a, you know, a quality of the workforce. There's a there's a clear quantity issue and, and demographics are kind of locked in, right? Like the size of the next generation that's going to come into the workforce. Like we already know what that is because we already know how many mm -hmm. people there are in the country that are age zero to 16, right? Like that, that's a, that's a number that's already, uh, unless you play with the immigration lens, right? That's a number that's already baked in. And that generation is smaller than the one that is retiring. So like, that's just, it's just math at this point. Right. So yeah, not to say you wouldn't focus on the education and all those things, but even if you manage to fix that, which would be quite challenging, it doesn't solve the whole problem, right? Right. So then if I'm looking at it from an individual company lens, I think it comes back to Andreas when I was asking you questions earlier, 
it was around how can an employee create value sort of for the corporation? Like what is the company doing to invest? But it's, it's also something you touched on, which is the, the employers need to attract that talent because if there's less talent, then you want to be the one who, you know, where you want to be the place the talent wants to go work. And so if we're just thinking fundamental math, there's less less pie. So you want to make sure you still get your piece of it, basically. And some of these incentives for your workforce are going to do that. that, that that's right. I mean, attracting and retaining um, talent is going to be key. But but again, in a world of scarcity, price goes up. So if you want to maintain the value or increase the value of your company, you have to find ways to enhance the value of what the uh, workforce is is capable of producing in order to that you can pay the higher price and still make your make your margins right and that's where it comes back to you have to figure out the investment scenario with what kind of investments can i make in my workforce not only that they come work for me and that they don't leave but but also that i'm getting more out of them in terms of value add than i have in the past because i'm going to have to do that in order to deal with this inevitable price dynamic that there's going to be this upward pressure in the price of labor. So you have to create value to offset that. And that's sort of an, I think that's a new mindset um, mm -hmm. for, for businesses. So then the other piece of math here is something Zane, you said earlier, which is women in the workforce. And you made the point that one of the greatest, I guess, growth of the workforce was when women entered. And then now we've seen them leave and, and not come back. And obviously, uh, there's a lot of reasons that may be the case, you know, expensive child care costs, uh, aging parents, those different types of things. So but that also seems like a place where from a structural point of view, maybe there are some changes that can be made that could address some of those issues. Or is that, again, sort of like immigration, it's a place you could get more workers, but maybe there's too many barriers. So I think uh, it is a structural issue. You're exactly right. And what's happening is that women and minorities tend to be overrepresented in these occupations, which tend to be more contact intensive. They are service sector occupations. Uh, but those occupations do not have the capacity to be working from home. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's something which has also led women to really fall out from the labor force in really substantial amounts. Uh, so so we, need, uh, we need to think about these things differently. I think we need, as we move towards automation and more investments in technology, I think we need to be willing uh, to be flexible in terms of uh, how we treat our employees as well as uh, the, the uh, options that they have uh, from working from home. And and when we often talk about working from home versus hybrid models versus uh, in-office models, I think there is an inherent inequality which is built in. Because what that means, what tells me, is that people who have the option from working from home work from home, but who do not really do not have that option. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so true for so many of the women and minorities who are um, overcrowded in these service sectors where they are coming into the stores and offices on a daily basis and have no other option. Right. A lot of very uh, intractable problems we're talking about here. So, you know, uh, Andrea, Zane touched on automation. And I think out of the sort of three tools we've, you know, talked about in terms of addressing some of these issues. One is investment in your workforce. One is overseas workers, which we've said maybe isn't a solution anytime soon. How about automation? Anything from that perspective as you're kind of looking at this issue? Well, I, I would say that there's probably two types of automation, right? There's the, I'm going to buy a machine that replaces workers, you know, that which is sort of the traditional type of automation, right? It used to take whatever it was, a thousand people working in an auto plant to 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 make uh to make cars and now it takes something substantially less because there's more robots. Mm -hmm. Um and, but then there's the second one which is probably the more um the more important one because uh I, I think the types of things that you're talking about automating now, certainly the, the types of uh, jobs that, that Zane was just talking about, that's that's much more challenging to develop a robot to uh, perform healthcare tasks and, 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 and things of that uh, and things of that nature. So I think it's more that it's the technology that sort of sits next to a person and makes them more productive. 
you read more and more about these types of augmentation type technologies where it's not replacing the person, it's making the person more productive because it's providing some additional capability or it's automating a repetitive portion of that person's uh, job, but that's not the entire job. So you can't have the robot replace the whole job. What it does is it takes that 20% away that's repetitive and then allows that person to take that time that's freed up and spend it on something more value enhancing or, or constructive. And so th that's probably where the, uh, where, where the, the innovation and some of the investment spend needs to go. So when we say investing in human capital, I'm not saying we'll just pay everybody 20% more and the problem goes away because that, that doesn't solve it or just send everybody to uh, some additional training classes and voila, problem solved. Some of that investment might be, I can make your job better by having this tool, whether it's AI or it might be a, you know, something more physical um, that eliminates the un unpleasant part of your job, which is a net positive for the, uh, for the worker, and then allows you to spend time on something more, more interesting, which tends to be the something that also is more value enhancing. So um, that, that's the way I would think about it. Yeah. And actually, Andreas, uh, you, those comments reminded me that when we're thinking about tapping an overseas workforce, I focused when I just did my summary on immigration, but there's also outsourcing and other types of arrangements where you can access those types of workers. And, you know, I think sometimes it's similar to what you just described of automation on sort of the 20%, but I think there's other opportunities to reach a skilled workforce. And so either you or Zane, any thoughts on how those types of arrangements fit in in sort of this current environment? So I think we have markets globally, Brazil, Indonesia, India, where you still have a talent surplus, uh, whereas in most of the advanced countries, you're dealing with talent deficits at this point, and uh, this gap is only going to grow over the next decade. You have a lot of companies who are trying to tap into diverse labor pools, but I think we need to fundamentally think differently about how we think uh, of foreign labor. I think we need to think from a more skilled talent perspective as opposed to labor arbitrage. Right. So if you go back uh, to the last three decades, we saw a lot of offshoring. A lot of that offshoring was done with the intention that we, it, it would lead to lower labor costs. And it did for a while. But I think now we need to adjust to this new reality where real wages are going up in those markets as well. But also that those markets have a surplus of technical talent. So if technical talent, skilled talent is something that we may want to tap into, then those markets um are a good place, but obviously there are a lot of adjustments cost, adjustment costs, transactional costs that we have to deal with. You're not dealing with a workforce which is adjacent to you. There are a lot of costs associated with time zone differences, so on and so forth. All right. A lot to think about there. So Andreas, any final thoughts on the current environment or I want to fast forward and see if we think we're going to be in better shape or the same or hopefully not worse in, you know, say three years? Well, I, I think maybe just on the current environment that this is not transitory, right? These trends we're talking about are sort of baked in and some of the realities are baked in because of politics and other other dynamics. So I really do think people need to approach this human capital topic in a very different way through this. You have to create value and you have to make investments because the price trend is going to be... Uh, is going to be upwards. All right. So then why don't we bring this all together? Zane, I feel like every time I talk to you, I'm left not feeling the most positive, but I'm hoping maybe if we look ahead in our crystal balls, uh, things are going to start to look a little better. So from both of your perspectives, what do you think will be the sort of the key messages in three years? And maybe Zane, I'll start with you. I think we are moving towards an economy which is going to be a lot older and uh, a lot more automated. Um, and I think businesses, if they have been depend over dependent on the trends which prevailed over the last three decades, their business models would need to ad adapt. Uh, they, so more investments, obviously, in automation. But as Andrea said, um, automation is something which is which should complement 
your existing labor pool in many cases. It shouldn't entirely substitute labor. It will drive up demand for more skilled labor. So at the same time as you are investing in digital assets, automation, you would need to make investments into human capital as well. You would need to invest in upscaling. And that's something which will go hand in hand with the investments that you're making in automation. Andreas, how about from your perspective? So I, th- I think the the optimistic way to frame this is you often hear people fretting that technology, automation, uh, investments in capital are going to eliminate jobs and there won't be enough jobs to go around. And now suddenly, because of some of the acceleration of trends that, that Zane mentioned um, in the last couple of years, we've almost flipped the narrative on its head where now we're in this world where people are starting to worry about a you know, long-term shortage of, of workers as opposed to some gigantic surplus. Um, so I think that's the that's the positive. And I would just come back to if you're living in a world of scarcity, no matter what it is, you have to find better ways to use a scarce asset. And so if, if workers are going to be a more scarce asset, that mindset needs to be one that you apply to all the decisions you make around human uh, human capital, no different than you would with I don't know, some IP that is uh, patent protected and therefore is inherently scarce. All right. Well, Andres, definitely, I think, a good comment to wrap things up on because it really summarizes sort of the point and it's an action item that people <laughs> can take away too. Thanks both for joining me today. That's our show for today. Tune in next week for more fresh episodes. So that you never miss any of our audio content, follow the PwC Accounting Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And to stay up to date on all our latest accounting and reporting news, sign up for our newsletter at viewpoint.pwc.com. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.